Okay, so it is now 11 o'clock. Um, this is, I think it's the fifth one that we've had so far. So I'm really glad that we are still able to keep everyone coming. Keep There's so much to talk about. And so um, we will just keep doing this until we built it all, I guess. <laughs> Give people a couple more minutes to come in. I think we're missing a uh, one of our facilitators right now. But if you guys have any topics that you'd specifically like to see happen, to talked about in this uh, this meeting this week, feel free to put them in the chat, and uh, we will see if we can start talking about them. Uh, so it looks like uh, Kristen is in, just wondering about time permissions after June 30th. Does anyone have any information about that? Uh, well, like temporary use? Anyone heard any news about that extending? I'm wondering the same thing as well, because I've only heard through June 30th. Does anyone know if that means that the the videos that have already been posted be taken down, or is that just for creating new videos? This is Patty from Kansas, and from as I understand, um, those publishers' rights run out between June 15 and June 30, and those all of those videos that are out there um, do need to come down. The ones that we've created, and probably some of those that were out there before, um, shouldn't be out there. And what I understand is, is certainly the big six are going to be out there um, hunting for those things. And you'll get the message back on your YouTube that says, this is a violation of copyright. Your video has been removed. So it gives you the chance now to go out there and, and take them down. What I've told the, the people that I work with is they need to keep track of when they're posting them, what books they're posting, and on what pl platforms. So they can go back and do all that in reverse. Um, and I recommend they only stay up two or three weeks. That way they don't get gobbled up in the first of June when we start doing something else. I've been setting our story time videos that I'm posting. We're posting them on our website and YouTube. And all, all we've been doing is setting them to expire on a certain date and then we'll just run through our entire website and take all of them down. But I plan on doing this the whole summer. Like we, we don't anticipate being able to start story times again for quite a while. So I'm wondering what we can do to keep offering virtual story times if all of the permissions have been taken away. <laughs> Does anybody know if you can like I guess personally reach out to the publishers once permissions are taken away, then to get permissions over certain stories? Uh, you can reach out to publishers, but I'm kind of hoping that once they see that, um, you know, this is continuing, that they might extend the permissions just for libraries beyond the June 30th date, even if it's just until the end of the summer. And um, hopefully that'll work out for us. This is Patty again. I really don't anticipate that. Think of how, think of how bad everybody's being hit economically. Uh, I, I would really be surprised if it happened. Um, after school gets technically gets out on the East Coast, I would expect those would, would drop away. I, again, I would be really surprised because I just don't know how financially they're going to recover if we're still giving it away for free. Okay. 
Um, that's true. The, oh. Hi, this is Barbara. Someone just called from there. Hi, Barbara. It's Shelly at Vortex. Uh huh. I'll mute that. Um, trying to look through the chat to see if there are any other things that, especially things that I don't think we have brought up before. Um, and feel free to ask questions aud with audio too. Um, if you have a conversation that you wanted to get started. Um, Hi, this is Bailey from Altus. Um, I don't know if we talked about it in depth. I think we hit on it a little bit last week, but um, as we are beginning to open up our libraries and if you're having limited number of people allowed in your facility or in your library, um, I know that we have patrons that would come and that would hang out all day, whether they're reading magazines or what they're doing. So in order to be able to let others in, how are you planning on monitoring their time? I know we've talked about like time limit on computers, but I'm more curious about just people, patrons who come in to browse the library in general, or maybe just sit down to read or working on things. Uh, this is CL from Spotswood, New Jersey. In the beginning, our plan right now is to um, make people call for appointments, and we're only going to take appointments for just so many people at a time, and we're going to have them go for an hour at a time with a break in between to kind of clean the high touch areas and to reshelf books in the meantime. I'm in a 4,000 square foot building, so I don't know how many more people we're gonna be allowed to have in at one time. And there are some questions in the chat about people. Are, are you posting staff at the door if you're reaching uh, like a capacity or do you have security guard? Hi, my name is Leslie. I'm from Maine, Springville, Maine. And um, we have a fairly uh, extensive reopening plan and we are definitely limiting the number of people in the building and we're using two separate entrances for two different reasons. One of them will be a library booking pickup. Um, and then once we open, this is kind of something we're having struggling on how to define. I think it's because it's um, it's a touchy spot. It's, how do I open my children's room? Because I can let people go in and get books, but kids, you know, by nature, they're tactile. You know, do I let one family in at a time? Do I limit family time? Uh, so we're struggling with how we place reasonable, um, fair and inviting limits just on our children's room. I appreciate any of your suggestions and advice. Thank you. Well, one of the things that we did right away was to pick up all the toys and disinfect them and then put them away. And we probably won't get those back out. That's gonna give any families that come in with children less things to do while they're in there. We also discussed on a district level, I'm a district library, um, not to whether or not to put the children's computers away like the AWE machines and we only have one now so that's not as big of a problem but it is a touch screen so that is another question do we take that one away too so it's really hard to make these determinations when you don't know how to keep everyone safe your staff and our building is not much bigger it's 4800 square feet and the children's area is one of the biggest areas and they love to come in there so it's really, uh, it, there's so many hard decisions right now. I think one thing that could help with that is having some sort of timer in the room. And so like, we don't have a room, so we can't control our uh, space very well. We won't, won't have patrons in the library yet, except for computer use. But one thing you could do is set that timer so that it's not you saying you need to go now, would be the timer dinging and saying, okay, the timer went off and then maybe a giveaway craft or something that, hey, you're heading out the door now, here's the thing you get to take with you, thank you for coming. And that gives you a little bit of face time with them and a little here, this is an exciting thing you get to take home with you. We'll see you next time. <laughs> kind of thing, that's just a thought. <laughs> hey, I've got a question, can you hear me? Hello? 
Yes, we can yes. hear you. Okay. How do you, I handle as, as we look at reopening, having, I have a librarian that's at high risk and we kind of work with our board in regards to maintaining wages through the end of April. And now we're looking at um, okay. talking with my board and stuff about reopening, but for this one individual, she does not feel comfortable because she's got asthma and allergies and a lot of kind of stuff. And um, she's looking at not coming back for her own safety. Um, has anybody dealt with that? Or even if she is here, she's got allergies and is coughing or sneezing, you know, in regards to my safety and the public safety, has anybody thought or handled that? I've thought about it. I haven't handled it yet, but I, I have a similar employee who has some immune issues and has had some serious health problems and I'm not going to have her come back in. All of ours are going to get paid because we are funded through tax receipts uh, revenue. So uh, I will have her doing some things from home. Right now she's making us masks, which is pretty darn exciting. She's a good seamstress. I was, also, I was also thinking about having people work from home if they have to and um, you know, having them find out from their doctors what, what limitations they are and trying to accommodate them as best as possible if there's a back area, staff area, and they could be working on projects there. I'm actually am that staffer with asthma and allergies and coughing and sneezing right now. And I'm it at my library. So I'm going to have to be here. I'm just going to have to wear a mask, you know, and I'm going to have to look at people and say, I've got allergies. I'm really sorry. You know, then, I mean, most of the people that come into my library already know that, but you know, it's, it's just going to have to happen that way. Well, and the I don't think you need to apologize for that. I think it's kind of the new way of the world and people are going to, are going to expect it. So I think, you know, if, if that's what you're comfortable, I think having, wearing a mask, if you're comfortable, you just do it. Well, for in, well, in Utah or just in general, I thought everybody should be wearing a mask in public, right? And then as, as far as paying people from home, um, you know, the American Library Association is, is encouraging boards to just pay uh, librarians um, regardless because you know it's not nobody planned on this but it's already in the budgets and people shouldn't be forced to go to work if they don't you know if they feel that their health will be compromised so that's the American Library Association stance in this. Yeah this is Jennifer from Texas um, we have a different kind of aspect from that we don't have a choice um, if you don't have a doctor's note or you're not on FMLA for this, you won't be paid. I mean, and for us, the money comes, um, it's great that they think everybody should be paid, but the reality is, is that most libraries who are government run are not going to do that without actually having people work at some capacity and we are having to open at 50% capacity in about two weeks. Um, we're being allotted time to get up glass car, you know, um, plexiglass shields and move furniture and do that kind of thing. But I have to tell you this week has been one of the most frustrating weeks for me. All right. If you're <laughs> Um, it's, it's very, very, um, very hard. And I think, um, every day I redo a reopening plan and have my governing board shoot it down and have to redo another one and have to do things my staff isn't happy with. And I'm one of those people who has to work from home as per a doctor's note. It, it's the most frustrating thing. It would have been better if, if I'm the expert, which I'm supposed to be correct, I'm the director of the library, that's why you hired me 15 years ago to do this job, then maybe you should have listened to me and waited till June 1st. And um, we were offering curbside. We now have extended curbside. We, you can do wireless printing from outside the building to our copier. We were offering all those kinds of things, but the governor changed his mind or stated that we will no longer as of tomorrow be 
closed basically. Uh, restaurants open tomorrow at 50%, depending on your county. We've only had eight cases total and we have less than five active now. So this is in um, Gainesville, near Gainesville, Texas, North Texas. So it, as much as I would love to say everybody can get paid, that's not happening. And it truly is out of my hands. Um, and my staff is not very happy with me today and I'm not very happy with my governing board and that's just the way it goes. So for you that are gonna start the process or have been working on it, I hope that yours has been much easier than mine has been. And I hope for those who haven't started the process, I hope that you will um, not have the, the awful experience that I've had the last two weeks. I'm now on version six of my reopening oh. plan. Gosh, so, Jennifer, that's hard. Uh, lots, of, really hard. lots of love being expressed for you in the chat, Jennifer. Absolutely. And, and uh, I would say if there's Thank any you. way that any of us can help you, you know, reach out for sure. Um, the question was asked just because they say you can doesn't mean you have to. And I believe that also varies from state to state and location to location. So really, really tough. Thanks for sharing your story. I would just duck in and say, I know that everyone here probably um, feels the same that we want to reserve judgment because we're not in those situations. We don't know what you're going through, but we can empathize. I'm in a situation where I have 17 governing authorities across a, a wide regional area, most of which yeah. is rural, and mm -hmm. they have completely different viewpoints about when we should be reopening and um, totally different political points on the spectrum. And so it is going to be quite challenging when my board meets tomorrow for them to decide um, how to go. I'm, I'm very strongly advocating for them to allow me to make decisions based on data, not politics and not dates that are set by a political agenda. Um, but again, you know, you do report to your board and it really is up to your board. Um, and I'm so sorry that you, I know that has to have been incredibly difficult. And Meredith, you and I should introduce ourselves as co-facilitators. Yes. I'm so sorry. We, yes. we were both a couple minutes late. So go yes. ahead, Meredith. Uh, I'm Meredith Wickham, and I am a library director of a regional library system in North Mississippi. I have 14 libraries, um, ranging from very, very rural, tiny, small towns um, up to a semi-urban uh, locations on the edge of Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and so I'm thrilled to be here, and I'll be watching the chat for questions to share with Mary. Perfect. And uh, I'm Mary Susi, State Librarian of North Dakota. Uh, so we, our smallest library in North Dakota serves a community of 90 people and our largest is Fargo. And so they're quite a bit larger. So, um, so we will, uh, you know, we'll continue. This has been great conversation so far. 90 people is the smallest. Yep. It's pretty awesome. Um, and, and, um, we are getting a lot of questions from our library community as well. And someone said to me the other day, you're our leader, lead us. I'm like, I'm your leader with no authority. So here's what I think you should do. But, you know, so th this is incredibly helpful for me. And I've, I've gleaned so much from all the plans you guys have shared as well. And, um, you know, we're spreading that far and wide. So we would love to continue this conversation um, Jennifer shared some of the frustrations that she's had with her reopen plan. Does anyone have a success that they can share with a reopen plan? I don't so much have when, a plan yet. Can you hear me okay? Yep, Michelle, go ahead. So yeah, we're in Iowa, um, like with Anne, and you know, so our governor has decided that two thirds of the state can start to reopen, which is you know great. Um, unfortunately, my library is located right between two large cities that are in counties that can't reopen. So we're like, you're not going to stop those people from migrating out of the closed counties to the open counties. Um, and she put, you know, it was restaurants could open at 50% capacity, 
gyms and libraries were things she singled out, which we just were super excited about. Um, but my board has, you know, decided at this time that we might restart curbside. We have a city council meeting Monday, and we're hoping that they're listening to the community because none of the restaurants in our town are reopening. They have all decided that they're just going to keep doing curbside service and pick up. They're not comfortable. So I'm like, we're hoping that they are listening and our community clearly does not feel like they're ready to be reopened. So we're hoping they'll you know, keep all the city buildings closed. And, um, but like I said, my board's like, if you want to start curbside, you can, and then we'll see what things look like in a couple weeks. But I think it was Anne that was, you know, concerned about reopening. And I would kind of maybe, you know, look around at your community. Is anything else reopening that's been given permission to, and kind of, you know, take that information to your board. And hopefully they can look at that because you, the community has been very understanding of all the restaurants you know, they're very supportive of them not choosing to open at this time. So I think that's a good indicator of, you know, kind of how we can follow along with what our community is wanting. Hi, I'm Jenny. I'm from Iowa also. And we are in one of the 22 of the 99 counties that is not opening because we're one of the leaders in positive cases. Um, so as they reopen counties around us and we also have these concerns so our fortunately i don't have a library board my library board is advisory so i report to my city manager and he's had daily meetings with us um, checking on our wealth every day and asking what he can do to help us so when we suggested as a recreation library that we have no nothing but virtual programming all summer and that we have an indefinite closure um, with no date so that we can decide. Um, he agreed to do that. The only upset in this whole community has been that the baseball fields are closed and people are not very happy about that, but people have been extraordinarily supportive of us at the library and do, doing the virtual programming only through the summer. So we felt very fortunate. That's awesome, Jenny. Thank you for sharing and you too. And Michelle, I'm not sure what your background is, but I wanna be sitting there right now. That was um, Belize like five years ago. I would like to be sitting there as well. My husband is back there fishing. He was using a um, fishing line tied to a coconut shell. He was really wanted to fish. <laughs> nice. Um, so, I'm, oh. oh, that's okay. I was just gonna say somebody had said that Iowa Library Association president shared some helpful models for reopening. If someone has a link to that, would you put it in the chat? She sent, sorry, I'm Amy, I'm from uh, Iowa as well. She sent it in an email. I will see if I can find that really quick. Oh, perfect. Put that in the chat. Thanks, Amy. Okay, go ahead, whoever started to talk. I'm Amy Brucker and I'm in Southwest Kansas. I serve a community of about 2,600. And um, I've been working on a phase plan for a while now. We have five phases with no plans to open uh, the doors to the public for an extended amount of time, but kind of the win I wanted to share, it was kind of a aha moment when I shared with some other directors in our system was uh, our county commissioners had called a special meeting for tomorrow at one o'clock after our governor releases her big statement today, uh, this evening. And they actually called and asked me to come as director said, we need to have your input. So, I mean, we're there. We're, um, we were actually one of the first uh, county departments they asked to shut the doors. Um, it concerns with what's going on and they they realize our plan will look very different from their county departments and I think that's a huge win for our community to see that that is wow that's all we're all you know giving you big thumbs up and claps and awesomes and way to go that's great does someone else have a win they can share This is Wendy on the other side of Kansas from Amy, and we're on the Friends of Kansas Library Board together, the statewide board, and she is our new president, and she's also a, an award winner through KLA, <laughs> best small library, uh, uh, this past year before we all shut down. Um, but I, I did want to say I feel very fortunate in that my board has allowed me to have the discretion. I don't think they want the responsibility of the decision making. And while um, I love our democratic governor, I'm, I'm gonna make my own decision about when to reopen here because there are too many people in my area, very small town that are seniors or on disability, like one in four people here are on disability. 
So I'm going to be very cautious and I'm also going to be worried about legal issues of reopening too soon and someone may be catching something here. I don't want that. Mm -hmm. And that's a question I've heard from a lot of libraries is what is our liability, potential liability? Uh, there is a question in the chat from Carissa. Is it the director or trustee's decision to have employees working from home for 50% of the time or whatever? Does someone want to weigh in on that? In my library system, my board authorized me to be flexible. Uh, they voted that it was an emergency situation on March the 13th, I believe, and um, that I needed to follow public health guidance and make decisions accordingly. And then what I did is um, listen to, of course, our state library commission, as well as all the governor's executive orders. And then our legislature also passed a bill that would allow um, us as uh, governing entities, we're, we're political subdivisions in Mississippi, to go ahead and pay our people full time, you know, full amount, even though they are at home on administrative leave. So administrative leave without, with pay rather is what we're doing. But um, really ultimately, I think, it, you know, if the board doesn't approve it, then I would be in trouble. Mm -hmm. I think you just hit the nail on the head too. And, and quite a few people in chat are saying, you know, it really, it, it varies from situation to situation. Um, someone said it really well, Patrick said, you know, every community is different, staff location, population, every, every library's reopening strategy will be different in some way as well. And I think you hit the nail on the head. That's what I've told our libraries here in North Dakota is I can't dictate it because you're, you're funded and governed locally. And in North Dakota, it's confusing because all of our libraries are municipal libraries, but they have governing boards. And so who has the power to shut the library is a little gray. Um, either the city or the library board was the opinion that we got, an unofficial opinion. So uh, one has anyone having success staying in sight mind for patrons, especially offline? Are you doing anything, any visible things to keep them, I can never say that word right, void? to keep them up? I can answer this one. Um, this is Cindy in Albion. Uh, we're in Michigan. We're a um, sort of small rural, we're, we're class three. Our service population is about 11,000 because I know the class structure is different from state to state. Um, we had previously had a really healthy relationship with um, our local food hub, uh, which was a business incubator for food and had was responsible for running the farmer's market and, but they'd been doing a monthly food distribution box for those who were in need and they've updated it. They've upgraded it to two and now they're doing three, but we've also, um, knowing that there's a lot of people on the other side of the digital divide in our community, we have a high poverty rate, um, that there's a lot of information when three or four weeks into our closure, by the governor, um, we were still getting people asking, calling and asking what our hours were. We knew that there were a lot of people who really did not have good information as to what was going on. And so I reached out to the mayor and I asked if there was any community like res coordinated response and there was a coordinated emergency response team and they added me to that discussion. Um, and we've been able to coordinate printing information, like just pages of updates on various things like applying for unemployment or um, sign up for SNAP benefits or uh, Michigan offers a double up food box where you buy a certain amount of produce with your SNAP benefits and you get a coupon to get an equal number in free fresh produce at a certain amount per week and and those kind of things um, just information that people who do not have robust internet connection or technology would need to know. And we're distributing those um, printing, which is a challenge because I have to create those, just piecing everything together in different flyers. And I've got a single volunteer who comes in and wears a mask and staples all these things together. And we're distributing them with anywhere between 200 and 250 food boxes that are being distributed every week between um, seniors and um, local sort of community action distributions, but also the food hub ones. And we're reaching people that would not otherwise be reached by any of our social media or online newsletter or website or anything like that. 
and they're the folks that perhaps need us the most right now. And while I have occasionally forgotten to slap the library's logo on the bottom of these things, because I've been just trying to get them done as quickly as possible, because I usually don't get that information until a couple hours before they have to be ready to be distributed, um, it's putting us in contact with a lot of other churches and nonprofits and um, agencies in our county in a way that will hopefully facilitate better, more positive and healthy partnerships um, going forward. So I may not be keeping the library in, in front of the eyes of the necessarily all the community, but those organizations are now viewing the library as a partnership. And we're also um, have just decided that we have a very healthy, um, uh, cheap per page printing for leasing through our print company um, that we decided rather than trying to buy and manage all of these printers and faxes and copiers ourselves, we just negotiated a really good rate with a company that comes out and provides all service, rental equipment, ink and toner, the whole kit. Um, for like seven cents a page for color and eight tenths of a cent for black and white pages. We're dropping the price on printing um, and copying for our nonprofits in the area, even to church bulletins. As long as it has the logo and the name on it, you can print it at this like five cents and 10 cent rate. And we're also dropping, um, we're gonna be announcing shortly, we're gonna be dropping the fax and copy and print pay copies or costs to patrons for resumes, cover letters, and anything that is going to DHS or unemployment, which Department of Health and Human Services here in Michigan. Wow, Sydney, what a great update and lots of claps and kudos for you in the chat as well. Thanks. You gave some really great ideas, um, especially the thought of uh, dropping the costs for faxing for certain things and copying, kudos. Uh, there's a question. What is the info that you put on the information sheet? Um, this week, it included information on um, the ex expansion of the double up food bucks. It went in statewide. It raised from $20 a week that you could get in free produce for matching and using that uh, to 50 Um Information on what the pandemic EBT was went out, um, the expanded hours, and Michigan's unemployment system got massively overwhelmed and their website crashed numerous times. And you couldn't even get the waiting list for the phone registration. You were just getting busy signals. So they had to change, they had to set specific hours and days for, you know, if your last name begins with A through L or M through Z, you had to apply on different days or you wouldn't get through. Um, that information, information on the updated, like where the food hub or the food distribution boxes were, which churches were offering sort of like online or phone sort of services, um, those kind of things, anything that we could think of that we were seeing come through new sources that would have an impact on like um, the uh, eviction hold that went out or um, student loan interest and mortgage uh, eviction or thing collections were going on hold. Those kind of things. And also um, YMCA came in, which they don't normally serve in Albion, um, came in and were offering emergency daycare for at a very low cost for children of essential workers, but people had to enroll. And so we took on the role of just trying to get that information out there as well as, you know, um, we're hoping, we've got a couple more churches that we're hoping to get in contact with because we'd like to be able to continue this as we begin to move into the next stages for things like library flyers or brochures or printed newsletters and keep in contact with these people and maybe partner with the schools for like, they're doing school, like school work packet and meal distributions to get in with that and maybe something like Meals on Wheels as well for things like we don't have a bookmobile or home delivery of books. Um, we've never had curbside before we're, what we're looking to do, but if those entities are already doing deliveries, then maybe we can coordinate so that they can also, if they're dropping a meal off, maybe they could also drop off, you know, this particular woman's books or if she wants to participate in our yarn craft club, but has run out of yarn. Maybe we can send that out since they're already going, but it all depends on those healthy relationships. And, um, but a lot of it's just essential information that just keeps changing um, related to unemployment and benefits and 
financial things and stuff re like related to the stimulus checks and who was eligible and who wasn't. And if you hadn't filed in the last two years, you need to file now. And um, just trying to connect people with those resources. That's just off the top of my head. I don't have that file immediately handy, but those kind of things. And it changes from week to week. So every time I basically have to rebuild that document that's being printed. And I get a lot of it from our partners on that coordinated uh, community response team. That's great, Cindy. Wow, a lot in there to unpack, isn't there? Lots of really great information. I mean, there's lots of great information in the chat. It's hard to keep up with all of it. So um, does anybody else have a way that they found to connect with your users who aren't able to connect with you online? We've actually been making some home deliveries to porches, which I know we're not supposed to do, but some people are homebound anyway and don't often come in the library unless someone drives them. Um, and it's a little bit of a risk on our part for a number of reasons, because there's a lot of sheriff's vehicles going around that might stop us, but we do it anyway. And they are so thankful. They usually make a phone call to us uh, to request these things. So we make sure that they are hygienically bagged and we leave those on the doorstep and, and they're able to pick them up and, and the ones that they have, they return to us the same way in a bag on their doorstep. Wow, so here we're allowed to, our, we have some libraries doing delivery like that and they don't have to worry about the sheriff's video. So woo, North Dakota. Um, there's a lot of great ideas. A lot of people are doing newspaper articles or radio spots. Um, some people said they, they dropped off, they've sent out cards to patrons. Uh, some people are calling their patrons just to check in and say, how's it going? Give them another human being to talk to. Baskets of books and newsletters with activity ideas in the grocery store and food pantries. Reading stories, poems, and excerpts on the radio once a week. May baskets to gas stations. Mail, that's how it would state library does. Mail is an option. It is expensive. That's, we mail books across the state. So we've been continuing to do that. Um, send out flyers with the city water bills. That one, I, I love the idea. Does it go to the people who just get their bills electronically though? Like I don't get any of my utility bills in the mail anymore. It's all just an email notification to go online and pay it. So I've wondered how effective that is. This is Diane. That was me that made the comment about the water bills. Mm -hmm. um, our little town of probably 150, <laughs> we still mail out paper wa uh, water bills to people. And it does only go to the city people, but at least it's getting information out there. Excellent. Thank you for that update, Diane. I think even if you can only reach the people that, you know, are getting things mailed, those are probably the ones that you're not reaching through Facebook and email and other outlets anyway. So it's probably a really good thing to be able to connect with them because I know that's one thing that we've really been struggling with making phone calls and stuff too, but there's just so many people that we know don't have the technology and mm -hmm. how do you communicate with them? That's, that's a great point. You're right. Um, there's another question. What do you put in your kids' craft kits? Anyone? This is Wendy again. I actually got that idea on the Arsa Lister and I communicated with the, I don't remember her name now. I apologize for that, but I communicated with the young lady who added that and she actually sent me pictures of what she was putting in hers and I based mine on those, although I didn't use the exact same thing she did. But it, the, the Kits for Kids contain a couple of paper plates, uh, little paint brushes, small lidded containers of paint, and activity pages like puzzles, coloring pages, etc. cetera. Um, trying to think what else is in there. And I think over the summer, we'll continue doing this through the local food store. They can pick them up there. Everybody is able to go to the food store all through this. 
and we, uh, it's a small town, so we made uh, an arrangement with them to put them on a rack near the checkout stand, and we just continue to um, take so many a day. Whenever they're out, they let us know, and they've been really popular. We haven't had a lot of feedback on them, but I know they're being used because they're still being picked up. We also leave them at the bank so people could drive through and pick them up at the window. So there was a question. Um, how, how are your libraries making sure that the items that you hand out aren't contaminated is the latest question in the chat. Thank you. We put them together very hygienically with gloves on, et cetera, and it's mostly just paper. There is some plastic, but we aren't actually touching any of these things. And then they're put in an envelope, which is sealed. We don't lick the envelope, it's a clasp envelope. Anybody else have an answer to that question? I can say we're planning to, we're, we're hoping to give out books in July. Uh, we, we typically give away across our region about 17,000 books for summer reading. And um, we're hoping to still make that happen for the kids. And um, one of the challenges we've had is wherever we hand out, making sure that we're not encouraging people to gather where they would not have already gathered, which has been our problem with like the little free libraries and all that good stuff. We're wanting to not encourage folks to come into places. So one of the solutions that we've come up with is um, that uh, we will cooperate and, and try to create partnerships with um, uh, laundromats and uh, you know food distribution locations for pa food pantries where people are already going to have to be for their their physical needs for their family um, and then make sure that we're offering books um, and asking those partners to put them into the boxes or into the, the things that people are already getting. Thanks Meredith. Um, and I hope I don't put your name and Montserrat I think you had uh, unmuted to say something. Did you have something you wanted to add? <laughs> Actually, it was about the crafts. It's some that you were mentioning. We did at our library, we started, we started something that's called Creativity Crates and we've been doing them weekly. This is our second week and our patrons, our community really loves it. Our only issue has been that they're loving them too much and now they're starting to fight over them on Facebook but um, it's been really nice we've been putting activities that the parents can do at home um, we have book suggestions from our overdrive um, uh, electronic books that they can get and we did an Earth Day one so we had little bags with dirt and we had seeds so that they can do their own earth garden they could also do a bird feeder um, this week was superhero, there was a superhero crate. So we had some crafts so they can make their own mask. And we had um, some superhero stories. And next week's gonna be insects. Our, and our patrons are really enjoying it. I think it's giving parents something um, fun to look forward to and the, par um, the kids too. We are actually delivering them. So they have to sign up. We created a Google form on our webpage and they have to sign up for them because we only have um, a limit of 60. Um, but it's been really great. The parents are loving them, the kids are loving them. So it's worked out great for our library. That sounds awesome. Um, there's a question from Kristen B in the chat about book points. If anyone has used book points for summer reading, were you required to install a new server to use it? Okay, it doesn't sound okay. like anybody has an answer. It looks like Kristen might be jumping in there. Okay, Kristen. Yeah, I can expound on that a little bit. Is anybody at all familiar with book points? Because um, I sent a query to our IT group asking if it's something that they think I could do not having software experience. And I got back that they would have to install two new servers for me to even download the software. Um, I, I don't know where that came from, if they were thinking that it was region-wide. 
yeah. And I was like, I thought it was just a free open source software. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I talked to my IT about it. I looked at this last week and set in on a demo um, because another library in our region was using it, but they have their own IT staff on hand. They're a, a much larger library than someone like us. And our regional IT person, I could tell was like, okay, you can do this, but it was kind of shying away from it. But we actually weren't looking at the downloadable, which is free. Um, we were looking at the paid. Um, and for a library my size, it was going to be $1,000 a year. And so um, we looked into another one, um, Beanstalk. I, I've heard it float around a little bit too. And it's for our library, our size, my quote was much more manageable. And it has like an app that goes along with it. So I, that's where we're looking at going to. I just want to mention this has come up in our state library when we talked about Beanstalk that some people who are working with Beanstalk is Beanstack and I keep wanting to say Beanstalk. We used to have it, our library actually got rid of it two years ago, but um, the, the folks that are wanting to jump on it are being told that they might not get an install in time for summer reading now. So if you are looking at it, I would get in touch with the vendor immediately yep. um, because you might not be able to get it installed by the time you need it if you want it for this summer. Um, so I wouldn't wait. Yes, that's a great point, Meredith. We actually, uh, North Dakota State Library is providing it for our libraries and there was a drop dead date to say yes. So, and then we had to go through procurement and we just got the contract to them. So I'm oh, everybody keep your fingers crossed that they get us up and running on time. There was another question. Um, the source for the 17,000 books. Yeah, I answered in the chat. Oh, I great. Thank you. In, and then I see a second question. Who are your vendors for sneeze guards? And I'm going to give you a fun one that we discovered recently um, in, in our area. Auto body mechanics who aren't doing a lot of work right now might work oh. with you to create a sneeze guard for you um, at a cheaper price and maybe even faster than you can get it from like a, a retailer online. Definitely worth a check because then you're supporting your local people. Um, so I just, that's a great idea, there. Meredith. Yeah. I wanted to say Michelle had comment, Michelle Turnus had commented that they're going to, um, include instructions on how to safely clean books when patrons get them home. Would you share that to the ARSO list once you've developed it, Michelle? Cause I think a lot of people are gonna, I call it networking, i.e. steal that. Cause that sounds fabulous. And in the chat, people are putting links, uh, at least I see one link so far to a sneeze guard. Um, you know, I, I will say for my library, we looked at the sneeze guard and we even tested it with a little bottle with glittery water in it just to see what we were talking about. And we have some pretty weird shaped circ desks in various libraries, you know, circles, ovals, U's, um, and we also know that people will be in the space that our, our librarians have always been encouraged to not stand behind the desk or just sit at the desk. And they're gonna have to come out and engage with patrons. They're not in a bubble. And so we ultimately decided that until we feel that it's safe enough to have patrons in there um, that, that we won't do it. And, um, and that the sneeze guard was not really an effective solution for us. Like once we analyzed the airflow and the fact that the latest research does appear to be that it, you know, if someone sneezes, those particles stay in your, um, your HVAC ducts and they stay for up to 15 hours. I just don't really think that a sneeze guard is going to do it for my people. Now, you may have a totally different library layout um, and that may be a controversial opinion, but um, until I feel like uh, we have a situation where it's a good call for us. A sneeze guard is basically a psychological aid, I think. It's making your people feel like you're taking that extra step to take care of them. But I don't know that it's actually effective if you study the science that we are aware of so far. So um, for us, it didn't make sense, the cost, even working with you know local guys, audio, auto body shops. But again, if you have a smaller library, a totally different flow situation, it may make perfect sense for your libraries. 
our IT guy is making our sneeze guard out of plexiglass. So we bought a four by eight sheet at Menards and he's cutting it to size. Um, so I don't, you're probably right, Meredith. We know that you are way more sciencey than I am. Um, but even if it's just psychological, I'm, I'm, we're putting up sneeze guards and we're gonna, you know. Um, and I totally get that. And I'm absolutely not making a, a value judgment on you guys with that. I, for us, my big fear is that our, um, our communities, our towns and cities and, um, and counties are not going to have as much money to spend on libraries next year. So I'm kind of stretching every dollar that I can right now. Yeah. The thought that every dollar, every cent that I can buffer is a cent that I can put toward payroll um, and keep my, my, cause I really feel like my libraries are nothing without my people. Like my people are what makes libraries happen for my communities. And so sneeze guards, I, I think we got a quote of like $18,000 for the whole system with $18,000. I can pay someone for a little while. And that's where I came down on ultimately. But again, you have to make the right decision for your yep. community, for your library layout. It's not, you know, it's not for me to judge. Absolutely not. We're all in this together. We want to support each other. And this is hard stuff, y'all. I don't know if any of you are getting compassion fatigue or decision fatigue from constantly every day making new decisions about, okay, I have to make a call on this. And I didn't study any of this. Um, you know, uh, I am not an as much as I love science, my husband's a scientist. Um, I did not study epidemiology. That is not my thing. And um, so I really respect all of you who are out there making the hard calls um, day after day. We're for you. Definitely. I think Arsel is for you. And um, I know we're all pulling for each other. I know I was on a call yesterday and I made the cut or Tuesday. I had to ask someone, today is Thursday, right? And so I was on a call earlier this week and and I said, like, I'm working crazy hours right now. I feel like I'm a public library director again, you guys. I mean, I'm working those kind of hours. So I'm right there in the pits with all you guys. The daily text I'm getting from my husband is, what time are you coming? He has not asked, are you coming home yet? We haven't gotten to that level. But, um, you know, I, I see my... One of my North Dakota librarians are, is on here. Thanks, Susie, for that shout out. Yes, it's still Thursday. So, you know, for everyone who was just really struggling with the fatigue and the decision making, and the, I've seen some of my friends say like, I, I, know, I don't know how many of you, but I have said this my whole library career, and I'm old, so my library career has been a long time, right? I have said, this is not brain surgery. Like what we're doing will wait till tomorrow. It's not life and death. And now all of a sudden, we're, I, I don't know. It that is. It, it, I know. Yeah, I mean, I didn't want to say that, Meredith, life. you know. I have said that my whole life, you know, my whole library life. Like hey, you can go home and rest. It's going to be okay. It'll be here tomorrow. It's not life or death. And now literally every day I might be asked to make six to 10 life and death decisions as a director it's an awful, awful thing. I, I just, I hate it for our profession. And I totally feel the person who says they feel like they're working three jobs. I feel like all I do is work and I'm trying really hard to set a good example for my people and take breaks, but I don't know how to do that and keep them safe um, sometimes. So I'm totally with all you and I, I'm, yeah, I'm grateful for the work you're doing on behalf of your people and Mary, you too. Sorry, yes. you're working public library director hours. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm so sorry I'm working husband. public library director in a pandemic hours. I'm really yeah, sorry. Yeah, no that. kidding. No kidding. I <laughs> see uh, Christy said, and she's spacier than ever. And isn't that the truth? I keep saying my, my brain now is like a sandbox that is full of water. Somebody started to jump in and say something. Who was it? I, I had a day yesterday where it was one of those, if it could go wrong, it did. Oh, Jennifer. You know, it was like, I, by the time I got home, I was like, why are my eyes not red and puffy and my face just completely oh. streaked with stuff? And I was like, I can't afford, because I have too many things going on that I have to get done. I, I'm it at my library, so it's all on me. But I was like, there were so many things that I was like, I have too many things I have to get done. So today... 
is summer reading planning day and I'm doing all the crafts that I'm going to be sending home with the kids because you know what? I need a day where I can just do something fun. <laughs> Absolutely. And like, forget all this other crap about yes. reopening and everything else. I'm just doing crafts today. You go, Jennifer. You That's do awesome. those crafts. And Terry, uh, good golly, hugs to you for working on your MLS degree in the middle of COVID brain. I mean, holy buckets. Y and you we have a few brand new directors in here, too. One of them just posted that she's been a director for 60 days. This oh. is not normal, honey. This is not. Don't worry. No. It, we want to all will, support you. We yes. will get through this, and it will it will be easier after this, God yes. willing, and the creek don't rise. Um, <laughs> for years, I've been saying, you know, every day's an adventure. Some days it's just Splash Mountain, and some days it's Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. And it feels like I've been running from that giant boulder for seven weeks now. <sighs> and my other answer is, how are you doing? Well, I'm upright and I'm self-ventilating, you know, because that, that sets the base <laughs> standard. Everything above that is gravy, but I can't say that anymore. And I have to stop myself because... It's a little much with a lung disease going around, but I, I will say this, like uh, this is my fourth or fifth Zoom meeting today, um, but this has been incredibly helpful. And there was another one earlier, Michigan Library Association brought in somebody from Bronson Health to talk about mental health and self-care in the age of COVID. And it was amazing. And if incredibly helpful like the stuff that we're talking about is she says that this is how brains survive like this is how we survive trauma you either flight which you become completely disengaged and not connecting you fight you become defensive or touchy or irritable you freeze where you just don't know what to do and can't do anything or you fawn and just say whatever you know what somebody else make the decision and i am all of those and it changes from day to day and she, remind, she reminded us all that productivity, what it used to be, that world is gone and we cannot expect productivity at the same level that we can now. And yes, we have absolutely very important decisions to make, but we cannot pour from an empty glass. And it's, it's sort of like those oxygen masks on an airplane. You've got to put your own on first. Um, and you have to ask yourself, like, how are you doing? And she said, right now, the two big things that are dragging people down, and we have to acknowledge them, are the what was, which is what used to be, which is grief. And we have to acknowledge it as grief and make space for that. And the what ifs, which is fear. And we have to make space for that too. And it's like, that if your state library or organization has not done something like that on what mental health and, and self-care looks like right now. This workshop puts so much into perspective to me now. We have to give ourselves grace because we are trying to survive a pandemic and carry our staff and our patrons along with us. And this is, it's not unprecedented, it's uncharted. And there is no new normal because it will always be strange for a very long time. But we can, we can do this. And this, this group, I've only attended like three times. You guys have been incredibly helpful and incredibly supportive to know that I'm not making these decisions by myself, that there's so many of us in the same place. And I, I will check with MLA and see if I can share the recording. But it was, I'm definitely sharing it with my staff and my board because we're, we're still in the trauma and trauma is too much too fast. And that's exactly yes. what this is. And if we can acknowledge that this is trauma, despite whether we're not immediately affected, like we're not in the worst case scenario. There's lots of people worse off than us, but that doesn't mean we're not dealing with it. And if we can acknowledge that we are dealing with grief and fear, that helped me so much. So much. Oh, wow. Cindy, that, that was awesome. I'm sorry I was temporarily distracted. Um, I, my IT staff just came in to tell me that we installed our first shower curtain uh, between staff desks. Cindy, that was incredible and, and so helpful, I think, just to acknowledge where, we, where we're at. Yes, there is grief, there is trauma, but there is hope, right? Um, we, are, we are rapidly approaching our conclusion here, so thanks for, for, 
finishing on that really wonderful, informative librarian kind of note. Um, we don't, we do not have to click off dead on at two o'clock or whatever time it is. So people can keep sharing, but if you do need to leave, we wanted to thank you all for thank joining you. us this week and for sharing and for the wonderfulness that is the Arcel community. Let's keep amazing. each other up. Let's keep sharing, yes. share the grief, share the trauma, but share the hope. And our governor does daily press conferences and he, and he finishes those by staying, saying, stay healthy, stay safe and stay connected. And that's what this group is doing. It's helping us to stay mentally healthy, to you know, share ideas on how to keep our staff and our patrons safe and how to stay connected. So thank you everyone for sharing. Um, the wonderful Arcel staff, Kate and them will share out all of the wonders. Meredith, go ahead. I just want to say thank you. Sorry, my kitty's making an appearance, but um, thank you all for the work you're doing. Really, um, you're, you're, it's incredible. Uh, everything I hear from you guys is incredible. So we're really thank grateful. You.